Hey dudes, welcome to Splash from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, we are going to take a trip down to the south and look into the world of country music. And we'll be talking to my good friend, the gorgeous, sweet, and multi-talented Erica Sunshine Lee. She's an old friend of mine from San Mateo, California. We used to work together at the Swinging Door. She performed there, and I was a bouncer there. Back 2007 to 2009, around that time, we worked together. And she's a sweet lady, very talented, as I said. And uh, we're going to talk about her beginnings um, in, the, in, the, in the country music world, her upbringing, you know, career. And we're going to reminisce about Swinging Door and all that fun stuff. And uh, today is Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day to all the veterans. My Uncle Danny, he's certainly a veteran and a hero. He's got, um, I believe he's got one of the awards or something. And I think he was a sergeant um, briefly at one point in Vietnam. Or maybe that was my grandpa. It was one of the two. But um, happy Memorial Day to all the veterans out there. War is hell. Remember that. And, um, yeah, so I will be talking to Erica Sunshine Lee, my good friend, and, yeah, it's going to be awesome. And so here's my interview with Erica Sunshine Lee. Hey, Erica. Hi. Hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Oh, I am great. It's been a while. <laughs> it's Tommy? Yep. Perfect. Good, yeah, yeah, I'm doing good. I just uh, actually walked in the door right now. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's been... Can you hear me all right? What was that? I said I just walked in the door, so it's perfect timing. Perfect. Yep. Wow. This is so. This is so awesome. It's it's been a while. We've known each other a long time, you know. Um, going back to the swinging door days, which we'll get into uh, in a little bit. But uh, uh -huh. I was I was curious. Is this your first podcast interview? Uh, with you, yes, but not not with uh, radio. Oh, okay. So, what I'd like to know first is, um, when did you first realize uh, that you knew you had musical talent? Well, I probably started singing in church when I was in, uh, probably five or six years old. And then I took over the mic and started singing everybody's parts at my preschool musical. So, <laughs> that was probably when I, I first got the bus. But when I um, led worship in church in middle school and high school, and then I just, I always love to sing along, go listen to music, to record the Top 40 Countdown, you know, just back yep. like in the day. And then once I moved to California, I started singing in karaoke bars every night I got the chance. And it wasn't until um, probably 2007 I started singing with the classic rock band uh, John Walton started. That was called The Rodeo Clowns. And yep. then I just, I realized how much I loved it. So I, I was singing back up with him for about two years, then I quit his band and I started my own band. And ended up inheriting a guitar through a breakup, started writing sad country songs, and then I went on the road full time in 2007. Wow. And were, were, your, were your parents musicians? Not at all. My mama sang in the choir, but my daddy always jokes around and says he can't carry a chain in a bucket. So it was definitely not hereditary, and they, they um, are both amazing people, and they did raise me going to church, so they definitely had something to do with getting me into the choir and singing early, but um, as far as a career move, no, that was definitely out of the box for my family tree. Wow. And who are your musical influences? Yeah, people ask that a lot, and I don't know that I necessarily always have the right answer, but I, I just know who I like, and I've always really appreciated old school country music, everything from Hank Senior to Charlie Cash and Dodge Parton's amazing writing. Um, but growing up, I listened to a lot of 90s country and 90s rock. Mm -hmm. So anything from my first CD was Smashing Pumpkins, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, my first cassette was Trisha Yearwood. So 
So anything from Shania Twain, Dixie Chicks, to Buddy M, Stone Temple Pilots, um, into the rock bunch, that is Nirvana, Pearl Jam. And then when I started writing country music, I'm a singer in a classic rock band, so I really got into the Death One Hundred Skinner, Fleetwood uh, Mac, and Tom Petty. Those are probably my favorites. And then to this day, I, I don't know that I have one influence, but I still really love classic rock and classic country. But some of the newer artists, um, as far as the country scene goes, I really I love the writing of Miranda Lambert, Casey Musgraves, um, Brandy Clark, and then some of the guys out there, like the Brantley Gilberts, and, and just, they're crushing it. You know, different songwriters that I hear on the radio today, even some of the modern pop country guys are out there I really like. Yeah, I've always been a rock guy, and just l lately, later in life, I've gotten to appreciate country a little bit more, and I um, enjoy it and stuff. Although I enjoy the older stuff, to me, country nowadays just has gotten to be too poppy, I think. And yeah, it's definitely got that fine line it walks, and I mean, some of it's so catchy, you can't help but bob your head up and down to it. Some of the songs on the radio now, but I'm um, then getting back to the roots of country because I love the aspect of storytelling, and that's what I fell in love with it. So it really jerked my heart out when I was a kid, and still does to this day when I hear a great storytelling. Yeah. Uh, when did you start playing guitar? I started back in 2007 and um, learned three chords and bought a capo, went out and played three hour shows. I didn't know any better. And then I started learning how to play. I just taught myself on YouTube. I didn't have any guitar lessons or a teacher or anything. And I, I like to watch other musicians and pick up on some things with my band members. But I was just self-taught, threw myself to the walls, and started writing songs. After I wrote 10 songs, I went to Georgia in a, in a trailer, and I recorded my first album. And then I recorded my second album with a producer in Half Moon Bay, California, Roger and Company. And then I went to Nashville, and I never looked back. Once I got there, I knew I was home. I loved the, the sound. I loved the musicians were incredible. They're world class. And being able to hear the song, sound in the studio, like fully produced, is, is the way that I heard it in my head. Mm -hmm. And I love being able to kind of also work with the producers and produce my own stuff so I know I'm getting the right sound for the song. And, and each producer that I work with, I like several different ones for different reasons, because some of them are more pop country, some of them have a better classic country vibe, and, and some of them have the right vision, so I've, just, I've experimented with different ones through the years, but um, I feel like I've definitely found my sound after eight albums. Wow, that's amazing, eight albums already, wow. Did you, uh, did you study um, any music or anything in college, though? No, actually, I was a business major. I majored in marketing, and I used to sell cars. So I was working at a car dealership selling Chevrolet, Cadillacs, and Hummers to get myself through college. And I, I had a minor degree in French. So nothing musical whatsoever. It was just more of a hobby, and I, I had no idea when I was growing up that it was something that you could actually do as a, quote, real job. And even now, some people, you know, through the years have, have said, you know, are you going to get a real job? Or how do you know? And I was like, well, actually, music is a real job. You know I mean? I made a living at it for 11 years full time. So I've toured the globe, and I've gotten to meet amazing people and work with some awesome artists. I write for other um, artists. I just produced my first album besides myself. Uh, her name is Reagan Willis, an East Tennessee artist, and she's incredible. Her voice is amazing. You can check it out on iTunes and Spotify um, called Like Minded Strangers. And she's only 18 years old, and she will blow your mind. Wow. The, 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 yeah, the business majoring, I can kind of see because uh, in such a short time that you've been doing this, you know, you really know how to promote yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I've learned if you don't tell people about your songs, your shows, and, and your albums and videos, then nobody else will. So it's definitely a huge part of it. And I think a lot of artists don't realize that going into it. And that's why they all, all have to have other people doing it for them. But I've just always really enjoyed both sides of the business um, because it is the music business. I think a lot of people, you know, forget the side of the business, but that's truly part of it. If you don't get your name out there, if you don't tell people about your shows, you don't tell them about your songs, you don't tell them about what's going on, then they don't know. So that's part of it. Yeah, I, I just been I've been hustling the last couple of years with my uh, stand up comedy and, and everything else I do ever since my car accident and everything. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying so hard to, like, promote myself and everything. It's just not easy. 
And it's, it's funny, right. too, because when I was at Swinging Door, I promoted the hell out of that bar, and I got so many people in there. I just don't know mm-hmm. what it is with my comedy that it's, just, it's really hard for me to get out there. Well, it's always, it's always hard to promote yourself, I think. I mean, especially for people that aren't naturally arrogant. <laughs> I think <laughs> people that are find this it's very difficult because there's a fine line between being a, a self-promoter and a narcissist. You've got to be your own biggest fan to tell people about you, but you don't want to annoy people. So there, there's always a fine line, and I know that when I started out, I checked everybody I knew every single time I had a show. And some people are like, take me off your list. And other people are like, thank you so much, I'll be there. And they showed up. So you learn real quick that not all of your friends are going to be fans. Yeah. I think you have to not take it personally. You just have to realize it as a business. And what you're selling, not everybody's going to buy. But the people that love what you do and support what you do are going to be the ones that you um, obviously stay close to and continue to keep in the list for future moves. And, and those are the people that are going to make the difference. That's true. You know, I've, I've learned so much about uh, my friends and stuff about how so many of them, you know, not all of them appreciate what I do and stuff. Right. It, it's just a very tricky thing. But, you know, I guess it's just part of life, I guess. But uh, what uh, what year what, what year did you move to the Bay Area? I moved out there in 2001. In 2001. That was the year I graduated high school. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, wow, that was a that was a crazy time. So, what exa- what exactly made you uh, want to move to the Bay Area? Well, I went to visit my sister, and I loved it so much. I stayed, and I started working full time. So that that was the big catalyst for me. And then I transferred schools, and then I just started to plug away doing music. But it wasn't um, it wasn't premeditated. It was just of the moment saying I loved it so much after a week or two I said I'm staying the whole summer and then after the end of the summer I'm staying and it was like I think about seven years I say so then I moved back to Nashville a couple of years ago and I've been back and forth I still pull out there about four times a year I'll be back in the Bay Area August and September and October performance so if you're around add me on bands in town it's a great app for all your favorite bands and musicians and that way whenever a show is booked near you you get an email to let you know and I was able to score like third row on a Henry Lou Harris Alice and Klaus concert because I got the email from bands in town otherwise I would have never known they were playing nice yeah I I tell people you know who move to the Bay Area now I say oh you poor poor thing because the Bay Area is not what it used to be yeah well, it's kind of always changing, and Nashville has gone so much, too. So I guess um, you're always going to be partial to the, the good old days in your life, um, no matter where you come from or, or what you do. I mean, I think about going home to Georgia. It's still pretty much the same, but there's always small things that change, and people move, and you cannot always go back to that snapshot in your life where everything seems rosy. But, um, like, red colored glasses can just to make things look. But... Um, Overall, I mean, I still love the Bay Area. I love the diversity. I love the people. I love just the opportunity and then the scenery and being able to go to the mountains and I can surf and snow ski and mountain bike in the same weekend, and it's just amazing. Mm-hmm. What, what's Nashville like now compared to the way it used to be? It's just so much busier. I mean, since the TV show Nashville, I think, blew it up, and a lot of people started coming just like droves, and now it's like the bachelor and bachelorette capital of the United States, and there's so many great bands everywhere you go. The restaurants have up their scale. I mean, there's just so many amazing premier restaurants. We still have dive bars. We still have um, the honky tonks that people come to see. But then there's a lot of swanky spots that have opened up. So there's more options, I think. Um, as a foodie, there's definitely a lot of amazing restaurants. And for people that are visiting, you can get your feel of good down-home cooking and old school country music or you can go out to the riskiest of the rich and have new pop country or you can go out and hear jazz and blues and so it's not all country like you say. Yeah, I'm trying to move to Los Angeles and when I was there a couple of years ago for vacation, I, I noticed that um, uh, Hollywood especially started to, started to remind me of different aspects of San Mateo and San Francisco and I was just like, oh, my God, San Mateo, San Francisco should not be like Hollywood. It should be its own person, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody's keeping up with Joe. Yeah, it's just, it's just insane, just the way the world is working now. Um, but, yeah, uh, 
so yeah, I, I met you in 2007 at Swinging Door, and we had just started getting bands there, and I remember my first impression of you, you're this sweet, gorgeous, talented country lady. That was that was my initial impression of you, and it was just a crazy time for me because I had just come back. I was in Arizona for a short time, and then I came back to the Bay Area, and there was everything just like happening so fast for me that year and stuff. How how, how did you uh, get uh, the gig at Swinging Door? Oh, I just called. I, I typically just call or go in in person, and I might have even stopped by talk to the artist and, hey, I'm in a band. No, this is time. You can replay. What dates do you have open? We'd love to come play here. And, and ever since then, because I started singing in the class of rock band, I learned a lot from John Hawk about how to book yourself, how to promote yourself. And, and I quit his band and started my own, and I just kind of went from there. Yeah, I, I, I lost count exactly. How many times did you um, perform there? Because I, I can remember at least two or three occasions you performed. Right. Mm-hmm. Actually, it was probably three times, now that you say that. Yeah. Three. It was mm-hmm. about three times. Yeah, I remember the fr- you were like one of the first bands that played there. And for the first six months I was there, first six, seven, eight months I was there, we had bands like once or twice a month there. And those were the only busy nights. And then it got to a point where the, our boss was um, um, didn't want to did, didn't want to uh, put forward um, money that the uh, bands were asking for. They got got to a point where they were asking for more okay. money, so um, he decided to just stick with the karaoke nights. And by that point, he got um, DJ Purple Steve Hayes to uh, mm-hmm. DJ there, and then pretty soon. The place was popping, and during the last month of Bay Meadows, uh, God, that place got so busy, and there were so many of my schoolmates. My promoting on MySpace, because this was just before Facebook hit, my, my promoting on MySpace just became huge after that. Mm-hmm. You know, and that first, that first year and a half I was there, it was an amazing time, and then the second half, it was a very crazy time it got nuts oh, yeah. during that that last year i was there in 2009 i mean he hired these two twin girls to like bartend and next thing you know there's all these gang related guys coming in and there's a fight every other weekend i mean it was just crazy at that time but it was the best time of my 20s as i look back i don't think my 20s were were that great overall but that period was like the best there for sure. Yeah, my first show was at O'Neill down the street. So I played a lot of shows in San Mateo and, and lived in Burlingame for a while. So it's always good coming back and play home. Mm-hmm. Did you ever play did you ever play St. James Gate? No, I have not, but um we were coming back to the Bay Area and playing a couple of weddings and festivals and we're playing at the Tick Jig in October on the sixth. Of October, it's a kidney fundraiser for kidney disease. So I'm really excited to be a part of that. They're going to be having a lot of barbecue, a lot, a lot of um, music all day, and, and different fun games. So for all ages to come out in the Silicon Valley, you can look it up online at Big Jig. And um, we'll be there playing. Also, if you want to see what other um, cities we'll be playing at, I know places in Livermore, a couple other ones in Petaluma. But August and September, October, you can go to my website, ericasunshinelee.com. Just click on tour date, and it will be coming to a city near you. Nice, nice. So, oh, so how, how did you start uh, recording initially? So uh, initially, I just like I said, I wrote about ten songs. I, I had a friend in Georgia, and he had a buddy that had a studio in his trailer, so we went there and recorded. But when I got to Nashville, I walked up and down Music Row and knocked on doors, and I literally walked into a studio and met a friend and started um, chatting with them and loved what they were doing. I loved their sound and they were kind of the most talented musicians. And I'm still recording with them to this day. I'm recording new music here this month. So, um, worked with them and some of the best guitarists in the world, Brent Mason, and um, played with Buddy Hyatt on keys and mm-hmm. the list goes on. Um, but they they knew what I wanted them to sound like. And when I heard them play, I mean, I can 
play my songs for them and then just hear them come to life. And they're, they're effortless for them. They're just flawless musicians. They're some of the best in the business. They're super professional and um, really excited to get some new music out. Um, my eighth album, Very Treasured, is now out on iTunes and Spotify. And if you want to support us, be able to listen to it on um Spotify and check it out. If you like the music, then you can download it or you can order the album on, on my website, ericasunshinelee.com. Nice. Nice. And you're very prolific um, with the songs you write and everything. Do you do you uh, do you uh, do you pay close attention uh, to each song and make sure you get it just right? I mean, do you ever is there ever a time where you feel like you're you're doing so much you just get burnt out? Honestly, I love writing songs. That's my therapy. I think it's my favorite part of my job. And so yeah. I, I do write songs for myself and other people. So when I'm writing for other people, I just try to put myself in their shoes. Or when I'm writing with other writers, um, we just collaborate and come together with a theme or an idea. And I feel like each song is like its own entity. So um, until the song is finished, it'll, it'll stay on me. But typically, I, I write faster than a lot of people. They usually comment that, I come up with lyrics pretty quickly, so I think once the song is written, it's written. I very rarely go back and rewrite, rewrite, but there are other people that I've worked with that have made me go back and rewrite, but um, I don't get blown out. I love that. That part of writing is my therapy, and whatever I'm going through or people around me are going through, I just channel that and use it, whether it's something that happened today or 10 years ago. And when we sit down to write the song or when I sit down by myself, a lot of times I just have lyrics in my head. And then whatever comes up comes out, and I pick up guitar and put music to it. And usually that's the order that I work with, mm-hmm. lyrics first, music second. But there are definitely times I've come up with guitar lists or riffs and think, oh, this would be cool. And then I start writing the, the lyrics to that. But I've written songs for um, over uh, hundreds of artists in Australia and in Nashville and being able to have my songs recorded by other artists is cool too because it gives you an opportunity to hear what it sounds like in somebody else's voice, but then it's still my words and my story. Um, like Reagan Willis's new EP, Like Minded Strangers, it's got a lot of really cool storytelling and it's, it's her voice and she's got an incredible, big, soulful, like a female Chris Stapleton mixed with Carrie Underwood type voice. And it's just interesting to hear the way it comes out with other people. So I love like Preston Somerville, what he's done with some of my songs, and Thomas Mountain, and Pierce Avenue, and Kirsty Lovely, and a lot of people in Australia. Um, but you can you just hear kind of the different sounds, and, and I love being able to write with other people to stretch my boundaries as well. Nice. Yeah, I remember th- up until my accident, I used to write like jokes every day, and now I just I got to, I'm at the point now where just, like, I can't do it. It's just, like, if I have a funny thought, I write it down, and that's it. I, I just get so burnt out on it. Yeah, and, and it can happen for sure. And I've, I've been, um, like, basically, when I write in Nashville, I have a, a, it is a job. Like, it's 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 5 o'clock. Like, I'll have two or three mm-hmm. meetings a day to write with people um, for them or with them. And, and you sometimes, yeah, you struggle to come up with an idea right away, but you keep plugging in it and keep bouncing ideas off each other. And not every time will you finish the song, but I'd say 98% of the time I like to finish the song before we part ways. Um, sometimes you, you tweak things and you work on them and get back together and you finish a bridge, but for the most part, I like to crank them out. And for me, I get my best ideas when I'm driving or when I'm alone a lot of times, even in the shower or whatever, you know, you just have like these ideas and I have to write them down quickly. Yeah. But I heard somebody else mention that Willie Nelson said, if I ever need to write a song, I just take a drive. Because he said that same thing. It's, uh, I guess it's <laughs> when I can clear my mind and my ideas are just my thoughts are to myself and, and you can kind of clear your head. And, and the one thing I've really worked on lately is trying to figure out what is the message that I want to tell people. Because you can write a song about anything, but if it's really going to touch other people, it's going to mean something to me. It's, it's going to be personal. It doesn't always have to be emotional. It could be a fun song. It could be a happy song. It could be sad. It can be whatever. But just what is the story I'm trying to tell and what do I want people to, to get out of hearing my music. So that's been my focus. And sometimes it's not always a song for me to sing as an artist. But as a writer, I just like to write whatever the song is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, uh, what's the what, what's the state you're in again? I'm in Tennessee right now. You're in Tennessee right now. The, uh, mm-hmm. don't, don't, you have a show coming up this week, right? Uh-huh. Tomorrow I'm playing in Tennessee um, and Nashville. Skin Rift Revival. It's a 
five year anniversary last week. That's a great songwriters night in Nashville downtown, and some of the best songwriters in town get to play there every week. So it's been really cool to, to see that grow and to be a part of it and play there tomorrow. And then this weekend, I'm going to be up in Manistee, Michigan, performing. We're going to get back for Nashville CMA Fest, playing two shows. 7th and 14th, and then I'm off to Europe for a three-week tour in Italy, Germany, and France. Nice. Wow, that's going to be good. Have you ever been to Europe? Yeah, this will be my 7th or 8th tour out there. Wow. Yeah, I'm planning on going to Europe next few years. I've been wanting to go there forever, I'll tell you. It's beautiful, and it's funny how I never thought growing up that Italians and Spanish people will be over there in Europe doing country line dances. Now they have line dances choreographed for several <laughs> of my songs. And some of the, the biggest choreographers in Spain and, and Madrid and in Milan, Italy, and they came to my show last year and they were teaching the, the line dancers my songs and showed them the line dances that they choreographed for Check Please and All of Us Go to Starbucks, What It Takes to Be a Country Man, You Saved Me, The Walk of Shame, and Now I'm a Pilot. Nice. <laughs> Nice. So I never would have thought growing up I'd have um, an Italian line dancer choreography, <laughs> choreographing a song, a, a dance for my song, but it was a lot of fun. And I love seeing them get in there. They have to have it, like different groups, and it's almost like line dancing games. You know, they come along with yeah. their, their uh, different clubs and partners, and it's a really big deal. So I love, I love going over there. They're really into the music, and they love the dance, and it's just the energy great. Wow, that's great. Yeah, have you? Have, I'm, I'm in Redding, California. Have you ever played in Redding? I've not played in Reading, but I played a uh, town outside there, and I don't remember the name because it was probably seven years ago. But uh, one of my good friends from my hometown in Georgia, John, he works at a bar out there, and we played there a while back. But mostly, I'm I'm kind of in the Kentucky to Santa Cruz zone. So I'm pedaling up to Santa Cruz on the coast, and then from Livermore to Truckee and Sacramento and back down. So that's kind of been my bread and butter when I'm in the Bay Area. We've done runs in LA and San Diego, but for the most part, I'm just the Bay Area was my home for so long, and I started my day in there. I usually tour there three or four times a year. I see. Yeah, I mean, make it at the Reno every now and then. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very, it's very southern over here in Reading, and they have lots of festivals. It's very family oriented out here. Yeah, I love, and I know they love country music up there, so I'm always open. If y'all ever have a place for me to play, you recommend, or you want to hire my band for an event or anything, you can just message me on my website or on Facebook, and also be sure to send me a message on Facebook that you are listening, and I'll send you a free download. Oh, great, great. Erica, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thanks for having me, and if you also get a chance, check out my latest music video, Taking the High Road, for all my California friends that so you can relate to that one. We shot it in Belize, California, up at Smile and Shooter Saloon, and it was a lot of fun. So thanks for watching it. If you want to follow me on my YouTube channel, my Instagram is Erica Sunshine Lee. Twitter is Erica Sunshine Lee. <laughs> they didn't have enough room for the last E. And Facebook is Erica Sunshine Lee. And be sure to check out my website to see the cool dates um, that are upcoming this EricaSunshineLee.com. Yes, everyone listening, Erica has uh, just uh, a, a, a wistful voice. Everyone, check her out. She is the best. Thank you so much, Tommy. It's great to talk to you. And hopefully, I'll see you when we're back in the Bay Area in August. Oh yes, I, if I if I if I make it down there, I will definitely see you. Perfect. All right. Well, have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. You too. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Erica Lee. Erica Sunshine Lee. Ain't she a sweetheart? Thank you so much, Erica. It was great uh, hearing about the countryside of the music spectrum and reminiscing a tiny bit about the Swinging Door days. Well, if you like this video, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, add me as a friend on Facebook, join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook, and follow me on Twitter and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. <laughs>